Psalm chapter 12. We'll read a few verses this evening to get our our thought and kind of remind us where we are. Uh, and then we'll, we'll pick up and we'll, we'll run tonight. Psalm chapter 12. Uh, we'll not stand. We'll just, we're not going to read the whole thing. Uh, but if you look at the end of the, the, uh, the division there, Psalm chapter 12, verse number 6, it says, Thy words, the words of the Lord, are pure words as silver, tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. Father, we're thankful for the reading of Your Word. I pray that You'll help us tonight as we jump in and begin to look at some of these thoughts tonight. Help us as we investigate our King James Bible. And we look at the the truth that we have and how You have preserved that and kept it for us. And Father, I pray that You'll help us to see the truth that is laid out before us. We love You. Thank You for Your goodness, Your grace, and Your mercy. In Jesus' name, Amen. All right, we're going to jump in. I'm going to try to uh, be as careful as we can about the time. I know last week it went a little bit longer than we have been. Uh, there's just a lot of stuff. Now, you realize that we've broken this thing down already into five different nights. Uh, and and we could, we, we, you could probably break it down even further than that, but it would just get to, be, to the point that it would be so long uh, that it would be kind of hard to remember what we've already talked about and what, where we're going. So we're trying to, to fight both ends of this thing. Uh, so if you'll just bear with us, uh, we'll try to get the, the, the best that we can tonight. We're going to pick up and review a little bit about what we've already learned. Just the statements that we've learned from each uh, uh, part that we did. <clears throat> the first one we talked about, the inspiration. So we learned that the Bible is the inspired, inerrant, infallible Word of the living God. We believe that. That it is inerrant, it is inspired, it is infallible. The second thing that we learned, the, night, the second night, we learned that God has preserved His perfect Word for us today. So we learned that He inspired it. We learned that He's preserved it. Uh, and then last week we talked about this. God gave us His Word in the autographs, preserved His Word through the centuries, and provided His Word to the English-speaking world. All right? That was last week. That brought us up to uh, 1611, brought us up to the King James Bible. All right. Now, this week uh, we're going to deal with the idea of investigating the, our King James Bible. There are a lot of things. Well, let's just move on. We'll, we'll talk about this as we go. All right. So this is where we ended up last time. I know the, the black is a little small, but that's all the stuff that we talked about. All the different. We talked about Erasmus. We talked about Tyndale. We talked about the Matthews Bible. And if all this is you're going, what? You need to get the CD because <laughs> there's no way we can go over all of that again. OK, uh, we talked about the Great Bible, the Geneva Bible. The, uh, we, we didn't mention the Bishop's Bible, but it's it's in there. Uh, and then we got to, to the King James 1611. Last week, we talked about how that came about, uh, what took place, why King James saw it necessary uh, to produce another Bible, how that was done, and, and exactly what took place as that Bible uh, uh, to, as close to the originals. Now, isn't it interesting that you have a... And I'm going to use this term for lack of a better term because we don't know, uh, but possibly a heathen king that God used and God worked through to produce the King James Bible that we have today. Now, I, I don't, again, I said last week, I don't trust King James for, for our Bible. I trust God. But it's amazing how God orchestrated that and worked all of that through to bring us to where we are. All right? So we'll pick up there. And we'll start talking about this King James. Now, there's a lot of controversy surrounding the King James Bible. You listen to folks talk, and you listen to the talking points, uh, and, and you listen to the advertisements of all of these other, other versions of the Scriptures, you're going you're gonna to hear a lot of stuff about your King James Bible. You, you know, you're going to hear that it's hard to read. You're going to hear that it's hard to understand. Uh, you're going to hear that there's archaic words in there. Uh, you know, you, you're going to hear a lot of stuff about the King James Bible. Without going into a lot of detail and spending a lot of time on that, number one, the King James Bible is actually written at a lower reading level than all the rest of them. When they, when they looked at it and, and, ju and, and graded it as, as they do in reading levels, it was lower than all the rest of them that are out there. That's a neat thing, right? 
Well, well, but it's just so hard to understand. No, for those that want to understand the Bible and have the Spirit of God within their heart, it, it, it's called study. All right? We live in an age. Now, you just, you just, you know, if, if this hits you, you just don't holler and nobody will know. Uh, but we live in an age where people are lazy and they don't want to study. They don't want to take the time to look and, and try to, to spend some time in looking and seeing what that says. That they want, they want to be spoon fed. Just smile and shake your head right there. It'll be okay. You know, preacher, you just stand up there and you tell us what, that's not how it works. That, that's called Catholicism. And we ain't that. All right. No, what I want to do is I want to encourage you to take your Bible, learn how to look at it, learn how to read it, learn how to, to glean from that what God has for you. Now, there's a time when we come together and I preach in it, and I enjoy that, and I want to encourage you in that, but if all you're getting is me preaching to you three times a week, you're going to be anemic in the things of God. You, you've got to get in this Bible, and you've got to study so, so there's a great controversy. And then there's a controversy about those archaic words. Well, you know, some of those words you just can't... You, listen, all of these modern versions, one of the things they keep saying is, well, we're taking all those archaic words out. If you... I, I'm not recommending you do this, but I'll just give you... I'll tell you, if you'd go and you'd read these other versions, there's just as many or more archaic words in them than there are the King James. Now, they won't tell you that. Because what they're trying to say is, we're making it easier for you. We're trying to take all the difficulty out of it. Now, my daddy used to tell me that, that, that what, you know, if it's worth doing, it's worth doing right, uh, and it may cost you a little something to get it done. Take a little effort. All right? So, yeah, there, there may be some controversy surrounding the King James Bible, but a lot of it is man-made controversy in trying to sell, I'm going to just say that and move on, in trying to sell their version of the Scriptures. And that's what it's all about. It's all about the almighty dollar. It's all about the Satan trying to water down the Word of God. So the question is this. Has the King James Bible been revised or altered from 1611? I didn't bring it out. I have one in my office that is a reproduction of the original 1611. Now, we can't afford a real one, but this is a reproduction. The 400th uh, anniversary of the King James Bible. Uh, they printed these. It's about this thick, you know, a little, little Bible. Um, but, you know, and if, you, and if you looked at that, and we'll look at it in a minute, you couldn't read it. It would not make, it, it would just, it'd blow your mind. And there's some reasons. So was the 1611, and, and you hear that all the time, and I, I say this uh, as gently as I can, we need to be careful what we say. Because so many times we give others ammunition to shoot back at us. Ah, bless God, we're King James 1611. I guarantee you, no one in this room is carrying a 1611 King James Bible. Oh, I know what you meant. And I knew what you were trying to say, but we're all family here. Those folks on the outside don't care what you meant. And what they'll do, they'll take that and they'll, they'll tie you up in all kind of knots. Well, that question right there, has the King James Bible been revised or altered from 1611? We're going to answer that question tonight. So can we trust our King James Bible? Yes, we can. And I'll say this very clearly and very plainly from the very beginning. If we cannot trust our King James Bible, we need to shut her down and go home. All right. So, so now, with that in mind, we're going to try to answer that, that, that main question. is: Has it been altered? And, and what are we talking about? All right. So let's jump in and we'll start looking at this as we go through. We'll talk about the revisions of the King James Bible first. Then we're going to talk about the supposed contradictions in the King James Bible. Now, we're not going to talk about all of them that they talk about. We don't have time for that. We'll hit some of the larger ones, and we'll just talk about uh, what we see in the Scriptures. Uh, and then we'll talk about the actu accuracy of the King James Bible as well. All right? So let's talk about the so-called revisions. There are four that are so-called revisions. Four times we find some things were changed in our King James Bible. Now, as we study this and we go through, what I want to do is show you these four so-called revisions. Isn't it neat how some folks want to do, they'll, they'll take things and they'll make statements, but they won't give you all the facts. 
kind of like politicians today. You know, they'll say one thing and, and anyway, all right. So when you talk about so-called revisions, has the King James from 1611 changed at all? Yes, it has. Now, I'm going to show you how it's changed and what took place. All right? You all ready for that? All right, here we go. There are only 400. Oh, hang on now. Woo, 400. There are only 400 textual changes in over 400 years. Now, don't panic, all right? I'm not fixing to cast doubt on your King James Bible. What I want to do is show you what these changes were and how ridiculous it is for people to stand up and say, well, they were revising the King James, and that's all we did with these new modern versions is exactly what they were already doing. All right? That's a, that's a ridiculous statement, and you'll see that as we go through. All right? The printing of the King James Bible was in 1611, possibly... Now, in doing research, possibly around May the 3rd to May the 5th. I like that May thing. That's when I was born. That's when all good things come out. So, you know, that's, that's about when it was. <laughs> it's a joke. Y'all can laugh right there. It's okay. He's lighting up a little bit. All right. So, this is what it would have looked like in the King James 1611 in that font. And this is the way it would have read. Now, most of you will recognize the verse, right? For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Now, that looks a little bit different than than ours, doesn't it? Just a little bit. This is basically, that's the best font that I could find in the Gothic font. That's not exactly right, but it's about as close as we could, I could get. All right. So that's about what it would have looked like uh, if we would get that Bible out of my office and open to John 3.16. That's about what you would see. All right. And, and it is a little different. So we're going to talk about what, what's different there and what was changed. The first revision took place in 1629. The second one was in 1638. That's not very many years after 1611. Now you understand, and let's just talk about this just for a moment, just for clarity. You understand there were no word processors. There were no hard drives. There were no computers. You couldn't just go in there and, and type over what was already there. Right? You understand in that movable type, when that when they found something that needed to be changed, they had to do, reset the whole page and repress that whole page. It wasn't something they did overnight. All right? So when we start looking at this and some adjustments that were made, it took a while to make these adjustments. All right? The first one was correcting some printing errors. Yes. There were some printing errors, but they were caught very quickly and they were fixed. Now, we're not talking about errors in the translation of the King James Bible. We're talking about that typeset error that was made in cult. Uh, and again, that's what I said. Remember, these were typeset errors, not errors with the translation. All right. They printed those. They got them done. They were examining those. They went, oh, wait a minute. This is not right right here. We got to get rid of this whole page and we got to do it over again. All right? And you can imagine how much effort that would have taken to go through each one and watch each page and go through the whole thing and do all of that. All right, uh, These typeset errors were found and corrected within 18 years of the original printing. Within 18 years, those printing errors were, were, were weeded out. They were fixed in that original printing of the 1611 King James. To me, well, see there, that just shows you 18 years. It took them, for, they're changing the Bible. No, they're, no. I think that's amazing that in 18 years they were able to go through and make sure that that was correct according to the translation. All right. The second one was a change in font. In 1638, the fonts began to change. They were, everything was changing over from this Gothic font that we showed you a moment ago to what we now use, which is called a Roman font. All it is is just the font of the lettering. That's all it was. All right? So you had several changes. You went from this, which was the Gothic, to that, which is the Roman. It's a whole lot easier to read. Made it a whole lot clearer. But there were several changes that had to take place. Number one, if you noticed a while ago, the S, capital, looks like our regular letter S. And at the end of a word, it looked like an S. But did you notice in what we read a while ago that in the middle of the word, it was an F, not an S. In the Gothic, that's the way it is. 
In the Roman, it's different. It's like we see it today. So they would have gone in and they would have changed that F in the middle of a word to an S. Didn't change the word. Didn't change the meaning. But these Bible critics count that as a revision to the King James Bible. So here we go. Here's the example. There's son at the beginning. Sons. And then in the middle it would have been sun. That's supposed to be sunset. That's the way it would. And they changed that to be sunset as we would read it. The second thing that we saw was the V's and the U's were opposite. I, as a kid, I wondered forever why we had a double U that was not a double U, it was a double V. Bothered me my whole childhood. I'm scarred. Double. But that's why <laughs> somebody agreed with that. Amen. All right. <laughs> but that's why the old Gothic V was that they were backwards. And they went to the Roman type. They had to change all of that and, and make it match the Roman uh, font. But your Bible critics will count that as a revision to the King James Bible. See, see, let me just say this right up front. I think they're stretching it just a little bit. I think they're working way too hard to try to prove something that's beyond proof. All right? Then we'll talk, and here, here's the example. You know, of course, have and have, that would have been the same word, uh, just in the, in, the, in the Gothic and in the Roman. And then the third, the, the next one, the J and the I, there was no J, there, there was no I in the Gothic. All right? Wait, there was no J, I get that backwards every time. There was no J in the Gothic font, right? That's why you would have stuff like this. That's why there's this big controversy over what Jesus' name was. Was it Jesus? Well, in the Gothic, there was no J. It was an I. And then in the Roman, it, 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 it went to the J. All right? Not a problem there. Same word, same pronunciation, same way it came out, just different font. And again, your Bible critics will say, well, see, there's a proof. One more about this proof. D, the letter D in the Gothic font had a tail that curved over the top of the letter D. They even counted that. When they changed the D to, to what we see, they, they counted that as a change to the King James Bible. I think they're stretching it just a little bit. All right? So that's the first two. The first one dealt with those typeset difficulties that they fixed within the first 18 years. The second one was the Gothic font change. That's all they changed were the fonts to get us to the first two. So here's the changes that were made. Here's that verse again. For God so loved the world, or ye world, that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And you can't really see it that well. I was afraid it was not going to work out. Uh, but if you'll notice right there, it's, well, you can see it better here, uh, where it says, uh, it, for God so loved, well, there's a change, that you went to a V. V, well, there's a change. Gave, well, there, that's a, that's a different letter, so there's a change. Whosoever, well, we changed some things there, so there's some changes. Believeth, well, there's another one, so you, you, you get my point. Did not change the, the, the words, did not change the meaning, did not change anything, but yet they're counting this as revisions and holding this as uh, a license to do what they're doing to the Bible now. Makes no sense. All right. Within 27 years of its first printing, 72% of the alleged textual corrections in the King James Bible were completed. 27 years, 72%, and that dealt with the typeset, and then it dealt with the font change. Now let's go forward. We've got two more real quick. <clears throat> the third one is spelling changes. Did you notice some odd things about that, those words that we read? In the 1600s, spelling was according to whim. It was all poetic. What looked better is the way they did it. They would add letters. They would drop letters. In the same, in the same sentence, you'd have two words spelled differently because it looked better with the words around it. It was a very poetic language. All right? Not until the 18th century did they begin to, 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 to stabilize the spelling of some words. Therefore, and there it is, you'd have additional E's, double vowels, 
double consonants. It, it was just the writer. It was, it was up to him. All right? Well, they started st standardizing all of that. So then you ended up with more of what we have today. Uh, and that, that blue really didn't show up real well. Let's see, this thing is supposed to have. There it is. All right. So, again, you can see that the red deals with the, and I'll probably stand in somebody's way. All right, here we go. Some over there, too. Uh, so, then you have sun there. You see how the spelling was changed to sun? Believeth. How the spelling was changed there? You know, but they, again, they counted those as textual changes to our King James Bible. No! Adjusting the spelling doesn't change the text. Doesn't change the Bible. Alright? Listen, I'm going I'm to jump in and I'm going to throw one at you for next week. You need to come back. Changing the word angel to eagle. Now that's a change. I mean, that's a big difference. You realize in the, in, in the book of Revelation, there's a verse over there that talks about an angel flying through heaven in your King James Bible, and most of your modern versions say an eagle. That's a little bit of a difference. Just a little. All right. You've got to come back next week. I'll show it to you. All right. So, we had the first uh, uh, 1692, 1638, 1762. Most of us, most of us in this room will carry a 1769 King James Bible. Most of us. Sometimes you've got to start looking now because it's getting to the point to where they're, they're making some other issues about it. But, but for most part, 1769 is what most people use today. And that's after the revisions, so-called, that we talked about. Correcting of the printing errors, the change in font, and the spelling changes that took place. Now, let me ask you a question. Have we changed the Word of God? No. We have not. There is no revision problem with the King James Bible when you stop and look and see what they did and the result of what took place. All right, anybody? I don't, you need me to go back and give you those four, those four again? I see some of you writing about as fast as you can. But the correction of the printing errors... The change in font, and three and four were the spelling changes. That's the so-called <clears throat> revision problem with the King James. What gives them license? They're, they're doing nothing more than the original translators of the King James did. They're just making it easier to read and clarifying some things and, and, and saying angel to eagle. You know, that just clears up a lot of stuff, right? All right. All right. So the next thing we need to look at real quickly is the supposed contradictions. Boy, and I hear this all the time. And, and listen, if you have one that I don't mention tonight, I, I am willing to sit down and talk with you as much as you would like concerning these, these contradictions in the King James Bible. We'll talk about them. We'll pray over them. We'll look at them. We'll study them out. And we'll see if we can find an answer. I have not found a, a problem yet that cannot be... Uh, uh, understood without prayer and study. Some of these I'm going to show you are stupid. And there's not another word. I'm sorry. I can't. I, I can't. I, I can't. I, I can't break it down any better than that. And some of them you got to think about. But when you look at it and think about it, now, what, what's our motto? What, what is the motto that we use? Somebody came. Somebody told me that I was just tickled to death. You want to make a preacher happy? Repeat something that he said in the message. That just. Somebody said this the other day. They said, Preacher, you, you said the other day you, we need to read the Bible carefully and we need to read the Bible slowly. If we'll read it carefully and we'll read it slowly, most of our questions will get answered in that reading. All right? So let's look at a few of these. These will be fun. Some Bible doubters continue to promote contradictions in the King James Bible. Here we go. Number one, there are some that say, you know, the Bible contradicts itself when it talks about the order of creation. See, in Genesis, there we go, Genesis chapter 1 and Genesis chapter 2 has two different orders. See, if you look in Genesis chapter 1, you'll understand that, it, that, that this is the order that's laid out in Genesis chapter 1. Heavens, earth, light, water, firmament, land and the plants, and that's the days that it was created. Sun, moon, and stars, birds and the fish, animals and man, 
That's the order in Genesis chapter 1. But then they'll read Genesis chapter 2 and they'll say, but in Genesis chapter 2 it says this, you have the heavens and the earth, then you have man, and then you have the animals, and then you have Eve, and it's all different than in Genesis chapter 2 than it is Genesis chapter 1. There's contradictions in your Bible. No, there's... Hang on! All right, doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out this one, right? Genesis chapter 1 talks about God revealing His creative work. He tells us how He created all things, right? And then if you'll read Genesis chapter 2 and read all of it and look at it as the way it's written, you'll find out that Genesis chapter 2, He's giving further detail into what and how He did what He did. He's talking about not creating the animals, but if you'll read Genesis chapter 2, you'll find out that Adam is naming the animals. And he's bringing all the animals before Adam. He names all of them. And, and, and then God says, after all that, there was no help meat found for Adam, or no, uh, no uh, I forget the word that he used right there. Uh, but then he, then he creates Eve, or he talks about the creation of Eve. There's no contradiction between 1 and 2. You have to have help to miss that one. But a lot of folks do. All right? So then we'll see this. Well, there's no moon, no sun, there's no moon, or there's no stars for the first three days. Well, that was not difficult to understand. That's absolutely correct. The, day, the sun, moon, and stars wasn't created until day four. So what's the answer? God created light, and He did not need the sun and the moon. To produce it. God created it and then He hung the moon and the stars and the sun as a sign for seasons for us. It's not difficult to put some... Now, these are some of the easy ones, okay? We'll get to a couple more that you've got to really think about here in a minute, all right? So we'll move on. The plants were created on day three and they'd survive easily for one day without a sun, right? Well, the, well those plants need that sun to live. We're talking about 24 hours. Take, Go home. Fellas, don't do this. Let your wife do it. Go home and take your plants and put them in the closet for 24 hours. I guarantee you, when you go back in 24 hours and take them out, they're still going to be alive. They may be drooping a little bit, but they're going to be alive. They'll survive one day without the sun. Now, let me just let me just throw this at you. Uh, we'll we'll just say it this way. Now, if you if you if you're mixed up and you, and you somehow got this idea that you know the Bible when it says uh, in, uh, you know one day and, and God created the heavens and the earth and, and and that was day one and and then he goes to day two and somehow you get confused with the idea that that's millions of years. Well, you got a bigger problem. So that's why it's very, very important that we understand and we read the Bible carefully and we understand that God means exactly what He says. And the e evening and the morning were the first day. Day one. That's what He said. And He goes through each one, each day that He creates. All right. <clears throat> Number three. What came first? Now we talked about this already, so we'll hurry. Uh, the beast or the, ma or the man. Uh, remember Genesis 1, 25. And God made the beast of the earth after His kind. Cattle after their kind, everything that creepeth upon the earth after his kind. God saw that it was good. God said, let, let, let us make man in our image and after our likeness. All right? And then in Genesis chapter 2, the Lord God said, it's not good that man should be alone. I will make him a help meet for him out of the ground. The Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air and brought unto him Adam to see what he would call. He created animals, uh, all the stuff first, man on the sixth day, and then chapter 2, he brought them all before Adam so he could name them. Not a big, not a big issue. All right? God creates in chapter 1, brings the animals before Adam to name them in chapter 2. All right. Were the fowls created from the water or the ground? Now, these are things that people will actually say, see, there's contradictions in the Bible. You know, I'm trying to be nice. I really am. But I do want to ask them, did you have help to be that dumb? Because you didn't get that way by yourself. All right? Again, Genesis chapter 1, verse 20, And God said, Let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creatures that had life and fowl that may fly above the earth in the open firmament of heaven. All right? What did he say? Let the waters bring forth abundantly. So the birds came from where? They came from the water. Obviously. All right? And then Genesis chapter 2, 19, Out of the ground, 
The Lord God formed every beast of the field, every fowl of the air, and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. And that's the same point we've been making the last couple. All right. He created in Genesis chapter 1. Now he's bringing all the animals before Adam in Genesis chapter 2 for him to name them. And isn't it amazing? Can we just stop right here and, and just say this? Isn't it amazing that how God created Adam with all the wisdom and knowledge? And, and you know, God brought up the giraffe, and nobody had ever seen a giraffe before. And Adam looks at it and goes, "That's a giraffe." Amazing! You got it right. You know, then that's that's a rhinoceros. Where did it? Anyway, it's amazing how how God put the intelligence into mankind. See, people think that we're getting better and better and better and better and better. No, if you'll read your Bible, you'll find out we're getting worse and worse and worse and worse and worse. That's a message for another time. All right. God, again, God creates chapter 1, brings down before Adam, chapter 2. Number 5. How, now, now, this is going to take you some thought. All right, you got to think about this one. And this is where most people mess up. I'm not saying they're dumb. They've just got a problem thinking. I'm just, just saying how many stalls and horsemen did Solomon have? Well, what's the Bible say? Well, let's look at it. 1 Kings chapter 4, verse 26, the Bible says, And Solomon had 40,000 stalls of horses for his chariots and 12,000 horsemen. That's what he says, 1 Kings chapter 4, verse 26. But then you go to 2 Chronicles chapter 9 and verse 25 and you read this, And Solomon had 4,000 stalls. Well, was it 4,000 or 40,000? See, there's your contradiction in the Bible. They can't even get it right. Is that a contradiction? What did it say? All right, let's go back. 1 Kings chapter 4, verse 26. We're going to read carefully, and we're going to read slowly. What does it say? Solomon had 40,000 stalls of horses for his chariots. Right? Did you get that? 2 Chronicles chapter, chapter 9, verse 25, the Bible says, And Solomon had 4,000 stalls for horses and chariots. He's talking about two different things. We'd read carefully and we'd read slowly, we'd see that. And there's your answer. 40,000 stalls of horses for his chariots and 4,000 stalls for horses and chariots. The Bible's correct if we'll just take our time to look at it and study it, and pray over it, and let God lead us into truth. Who is the father of Joseph? Well, Matthew chapter 1, verse 16, the Bible says, And Jacob beget Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called Christ. That's what it says in Matthew chapter 1, verse 16. Then you get over to Luke chapter 2 and verse 23, and the Bible says, And Jesus Himself began to be a, a, about 30 years of age, being as was supposed the son of Joseph, which was the son of Heli. Oh, now wait a minute. Now we've got the son of Jacob, and then the son of Heli. Well, now what's going on here? H how many of you ha have ever looked at the genealogies of Matthew and Luke? You, you do under Katie's got her hand up. She well, she she was she she been around me too much. Oh, this, this, Matthew and Luke look at two different things. Matthew is looking at Jesus uh, from the kingly lineage. Luke is looking at Jesus from the human standpoint. Matthew traces the lineage through Jacob uh, through Joseph all the way back to David. But there's something interesting in that. If you look at that lineage, there's one fella's name in there that just kind of pops up. Now, you got to study. I'm telling you, this is why people miss it. They don't want to study. There's one guy's name, and I didn't write all this down, but there's one guy's name in there, uh, uh, if I get it right, it's uh, Jeconiah. And he was not a very good king. Matter of fact, he was a pretty wicked boy. And what happened in the line of Jeconiah was God was so disappointed in him that he makes a statement that says no one of the lineage of Jeconiah will ever sit on the throne of David again. I mean, he cuts them off completely. And that's the lineage that Joseph comes from. But if you look in Luke, you'll find 
that while the focus was always on the male, you can say what you want to about that, Luke is the lineage of Mary. Heli was Mary's dad. And you start tracing that back and you'll follow the lineage of Mary all the way back to David just like Jacob, uh, Joseph. So you'll find the fulfillment of the prophecy, not the way man would see it or the way man would trace it. Isn't that interesting? That God does something the way man doesn't look at it. We still have the fulfillment of prophecy just through the lineage of Mary instead of the lineage of Joseph. Because Joseph wasn't his daddy anyway. Amen. Y'all can just smile right there. It's Matthew, the kingly lineage, traces through the male of jo or, or Joseph, but Jesus was not the son of Joseph. Uh, then Luke presents the son of man and traces the lineage through Mary uh, to fulfill the promise to David of his seed sitting on the throne. It took a little work. It takes a little reading. It takes a little understanding the Word of God. But when you do that, you can see the answers to these questions that come up. Number seven, who, what were Jesus' last words? can't even believe there's a, a controversy over that. But there is. Matthew 27, verse 46, and, and verse 50, At about the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is to say, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And, and then in verse 50 it says, Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. Alright? And then you have in Luke 23, verse 46, and Jesus, and when Jesus had cried with a loud voice, He said, Father, into Thy hands I commend My Spirit. And having thus said, He gave up the ghost. So was it, My God, My God, why hast Thou forsaken Me? Or was it, Father, into Thy hands I commend My Spirit? Or John chapter 19, verse 30, when Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, He said, It is finished. And He bowed His head and gave up the ghost. Oh, man. How are we ever going to know? How are we going to get this one right? I mean, the Bible's full of contradictions. Is it? A synopsis or a harmony of the Gospels is what answers that question. You understand that there are stories in the Gospels, that, that there are some stories that are covered in all four Gospels. There are some stories that are covered in one Gospel. But when you harmonize that and you put them all together, you get a full timeline of the life of Christ. All right? Luke chapter 23, verse 34, he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. All right? <clears throat> then uh, in Luke 23, 43, he said, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise talking to the thief. Uh, and then we had John 19, verse 26 and verse 27. He, he tells Mary, Behold thy, or, or yeah, he tells Mary, Behold thy son. And he tells John, Behold thy mother. He has that conversation there. Uh, and then we find in, in Matthew chapter 27, verse number 46, Why hast thou forsaken me? My God, that we, we read that one. Why hast thou forsaken me? Uh, and then he said in John 19, verse 28, I thirst. All right, I thirst. Uh, and then it is finished in John 19 and verse 30. It is finished. And then finally, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. Luke 23, verse 46. A reading of the Gospels, a harmony of those Gospels, give us exactly what took place. No contradictions. No contradictions in the Word of God. Now, as much as they stretch to say there were a revision problem with the King James, can you see how many people are trying to stretch this problem of contradictions in the King James? All right. Now, is Jesus equal or lesser than God? Well, that's a theological question we could debate for a while, huh? Well, let's look at what it says. John chapter 10, verse 30. I and my Father are one. That's what Jesus said. I and my Father are one. But what about this verse? John 14, verse 28. You have heard how I said unto you, I go away and come again unto you. If you love me, you would rejoice because I say I go into my Father and my Father is greater than I. Oh, whoa, 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 wait a minute. Didn't he just say in chapter 10 that he and the Father are one? And now he's saying in John chapter 14 that the Father is greater than he? What do you do with that contradiction right there? No, understand what he's talking about. He is equal with God in essence. He is equal with God in the Godhead. But we understand that the Bible tells us this, that he, he was made lesser than the angels. He became lower than the angels by choice and purpose in identifying with mankind. No contradiction. 
a statement of truth and a statement of what Jesus did for us in leaving glory and coming to this earth and identifying with us to be our sacrifice for sin. Great theology, not contradiction. All right? I don't know of a supposed contradiction that has stood up to a careful reading of the, and faith in the Bible as God's Word. I've not been shown one yet that cannot be answered if we will stop and look at the Bible and read it and study it and pray over it and look for it and believe that this is the Word of the living God. I don't know of a contradiction. Now, you may have heard another one. You may have heard something else. That's fine. If you want to talk about it after service, we're more than welcome to do that. Uh, we'll discuss it with you as long as you want to. But we got to go. It's 7.05 and i got one point left. All right? So I told you, I'm going to try to hurry. I'm trying. What about scientific accuracy? We'll run through this real quick because it's, it's really neat. If folks would just listen to the Bible, they'd find out a whole lot of stuff they didn't know. All right? Let's talk about a couple of them. The Bible is also scientifically accurate. Number one, the Bible says plants and animals reproduce after their kind. <laughs> Duh. That kind of knocks the head in evolution, doesn't it? A rock will never become a monkey. Things reproduce after its own kind. Now, we may have 40 different types of dogs, and, you know, or, or there's more than 40, but, you know, however many there are, but they're all dogs. And they all have a common dog ancestor. There's not a banana anywhere in that bunch. It's all dogs, right? So the Bible said very clearly that the plants and animals will reproduce after their kind. All right, and that's exactly what happened. Number two, the Bible says the earth is hung upon nothing. You realize that, that all of these philosophers, that all these years, every society always had a, uh, a, a plan or, or had a, 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 a hypothesis of how that worked. Uh, some of them believed in elephants. There, there was one right there. Uh, they believed that, that that was in India. You know, that, that was there, their, their turtle with the elephant. I don't know. Uh, there, there again, there's the turtle and the elephants there. Uh, and there's that boy, what was his name, Atlas, uh, held up the world. You know, everybody had a theory. No, the Bible says the earth was hung on nothing. And if we just believe the Bible, we'd understand, we, we'd understand science. The Bible says the earth is a circle. Do you, did you realize, I did not realize this until just a few months ago, did you realize there is still a group of people today that believe the earth is flat and will argue with you? Oh, you want to have some fun? Go home and get on YouTube and, and look it up. Flat earthers. Look it up. I mean, it's funny. I mean, all kind of, I mean, they, they've measured, they, you know, they, they just give you one. Say, I got to hurry. No, you just show it. There, there's one guy on there had a video. He, he put a, a laser across a lake. And I forgot how many miles it was, like 17 miles or something. And, and, he, and he calculated in 17 miles how much drop there should have been in that laser for the curvature of the earth. And, you know, and then he measures it, you know, and all that. And he proves that it's got to be flat because you can see that laser. Anyway. There's a lot of folks. There's a lot of theories, a lot of, you know, everybody, they all, all the ancient mariners, you know, they just were scared they were going to sail off the age of the earth. And here, let me help you over here. Uh, you know, they, 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 just different one. You know, everybody had this, this flat earth theory. Uh, and, and, and really, if they just read the Bible, they'd find out they were wrong. It's a circle. The circle of the earth. That's what the Bible talks about. Interesting, isn't it? The Bible talks about the pathways in the sea in Isaiah 43, verse 16. The pathways in the sea. You know, it wasn't... It, it was a long time before people understood about the currents and the pathways. It's almost like super highways in the sea. You know, and some of those, you know, if you if you want to go uh, uh, that direction on that map, you, you don't want to get down here and try to do it in those blue lines. Because you're going the wrong way. It'd be like getting out here on the road, try to drive the wrong way on the, in the highway. It ain't going to work. All right? And they didn't understand that. What was in the Bible? Isaiah 43, 16 talked about it. If they just read the Bible, it was in there. Isaiah. Oh, and I think Isaiah, wasn't that written, wasn't that written in the Old Testament? Okay. All right. I'm just, I was just trying to get, I'm just trying to make sure I got it straight there. All right. The Bible says that air has weight. Job 28, verse 25. I don't know when they figured that one out, but it was way after Job wrote about it. 
Job 28, verse 25. You can write these verses down. I, we just didn't have time to look at all of them. All right? What about this one? The Bible says there are springs in the sea. I know this one. They didn't figure out that there were springs. Where'd you go? Get back over here. They didn't know that there were springs in the sea until 1973. Job knew about it. Job 38, verse 16, talked about the springs in the sea. See, the Bible is scientifically accurate. If they'd just read it, they'd understand that. The Bible describes the way of light and the place of darkness. The way. You, you realize the Bible understood that light travels. The way of light. And that darkness has a place because darkness is nothing more than the absence of light. So you didn't realize we was that smart, did you? If we just read our Bible, we'd be geniuses. Y'all catch that in a minute. All right. The Bible describes a hydrological cycle. Job Again, we're back in the Old Testament. Job 38, Ecclesiastes chapter 1. It talks about that cycle of evaporation, atmospheric circulation, condensation, precipitation, runoff, that whole cycle. It's talked about in the Old Testament. I know, I'm just, I'm just throwing these out so you can understand what we have in our King James Bible. There's not a revision problem. Changing a font, changing a spelling, that's not a problem. All right? There, there's not a contradiction problem. Read the Bible carefully and slowly. Study it. Pray over it. Seek God. Hey, listen, if you don't understand something in the Bible, it's not God's fault. Just keep praying and keep learning and keep looking and we'll get to that place where God can reveal to us that truth. Number nine, the Bible says that the, the light creates the wind. Job 38, verse 24. That's exactly how it happens. As, as the sun warms the water and the, water, and the, and the heat rises and, and all that. And that it, it, I don't know how all that works. I'm not that smart. But the Bible talks about it. Way before the scientists knew about it. We just read the Bible and trust what it says. Number 10, the Bible says that life is in the blood. You realize George Washington, that a lot of folks say that George Washington, what killed George Washington wasn't the disease that he had, but it was the doctors that bled him to death. Because the doctors back in George Washington's day believed that when you had a disease or a sickness, it was a blood problem, you had bad blood. So what they would do, literally, is they would bleed you to get rid of the bad blood. They'd just read the Bible, they'd figure it out in Leviticus 17, that life is in the blood. Scientific discovery has not disproved the Bible. I am not aware, and I'm going to say it that way, because I'm not all-knowing, but I am not aware of one scientific discovery that has ever contradicted the Bible. Now, if you know of one, bring it to me. We'll talk about it. We'll look it up. We'll study it. We'll see. But I don't know of one. The Bible is scientifically accurate. The Bible is historically accurate. The Word of God is the Word of God. The, the evidence is without question. We have, without a doubt, the inspired, inerrant, infallible, inexhaustible Word of God in our King James Bible. God has preserved it for us. God has translated it for us. God has given us His perfected Word in His King James Bible. Now here's what we're going to do next week. I called Lifeway Bookstore in Paducah. The guy thought I was nuts. But that's okay, a lot of folks do. I called the bookstore in Paducah and I said, look, I, I need, I, I need, I'm doing some research. I'm a pastor of a church here in, uh, and told him where I pastored, told him who I was. And I said, I, I'm doing some research and I just have a question for you. And I'd like, I don't need, a, you know, the numbers. I just want your best guess. I said, uh, can you tell me what the number one selling Bible is in Paducah from, from your store? And he was all happy and good until I asked him that question. <laughs> and then he started him on around a little bit. Uh, well, uh, 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 he, he didn't really want to tell me. 
And I said, I said, brother, you know, I'm not trying to be. Yeah, I just, I'm just doing some research, and I need some, uh, some, some validation on some things that I'm looking at. He said, okay, let me think. He said, probably the best-selling Bible that we have that, that goes off the shelf is going to be the NIV, followed by the King James, which makes sense. Nationally, in 2015, that's the latest statistics that we have. Nationally, 2015, the King James Bible was still the number one selling Bible nationally. 31% of the Bible... Y'all catch that. 31% of the Bibles that were sold in America were King James Bibles. In Paducah, it was the NIV. So here's what I've done, and here's what we'll have for next week. Next week, we're going to talk a little bit more about how these modern versions came about. Remember, we got up to Westcott and Hort last time, and we kind of left it right there. We're going to go back and pick up right there, see what they did, and then we're going to make a comparison. What I want to do next week is I just want to show you some of the differences between the NIV and the King James. I want to show you some verses that are missing. I want to show you some verses that are changed. And I just want to demonstrate to you this statement and the one that I hope we burn into your brain next week. Things that are different are not the same. That's deep, isn't it? But that's the truth. Things that are different are not the same. We have... In our King James Bible, everything that we need. Don't fall for the lies. Don't fall for the marketing. Don't fall for the money-hungry people that try to tell you that your King James Bible is out of date, that it's archaic, that it needs to be updated and fixed. We have the truth of the Word of God in our King James Bible. So that brings us up to date. And next week we'll finish talking about the history of the English Bible by just demonstrating to you the differences. Now, we, we, I, I, I've chosen the NIV because that's the best selling here. When I was in Mississippi, the area we were down there, the English Standard Version has become the favored version there. So I did the, exactly what I'm doing next week with the NIV, with the, e, the, the ESV down there. And the thing is, you could do it with just about every... Try to be careful. Perversion. <laughs> because they all come from the same place. And we'll demonstrate that next week. Let's stand.